Hi, thanks. Thanks, Jenny. Um, good morning. And I have the exams here. I'll try to give it after class a little bit. Uh, uh, so I think you should drop by my office. Um, I didn't sort them, so if you had to go through the stuff. So here the 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 way the scores came out. This is for the for the exam. So that's like a six and a five and a half and four and you know um, five and four and a half and four kind of stuff. And this is the adding the quiz and everything so far, right? It doesn't mean much at this point. Um, and the way I tried to grade, um, I like to see some definite change in grade to change the letter grade. So for example, I don't go by a 90 and above is an A, and if you get 89.9, you get a B kind of stuff, right? So I tried to see. So for example, like, like the exam graph like that, seems like one could give a grade like, all the ones in the top is A, A minus, B, you know, B plus, and so on and so forth, right? And there's like no such trend here, but I think it's still too early, right? Um, so, like I said, you know, we can get the exams later. Um, one of the nice things about having all this many assignments and homeworks and projects are you should have a good idea of where you stand. Um, and towards the end, I replace one of your porous grade with the median for that particular stuff, right? So if you got something really poor, if it's way below median, I replace one of that with the median of the class. Obviously, if you're above median, then it doesn't help. But um, but but otherwise, if you thought you didn't do well in one of this stuff and you want to do something, make up or something, suggest something to me right now um, or when, when things happen. Don't wait till the last moment. I've had students who come by like, like the day before, I had to turn in the grades and say, like, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know the grades are going poorly. Is there anything I can do about it? And chances are, there's very little I can do at that stage, right? So if you're worried, talk to me earlier, right? Make sense, right? Since we have so many data points, I, I kind of know how you're doing in class, right? So if you if you're getting all very good scores and you did poorly on one or two, there's things we can do. If you're doing poorly throughout the lecture, we have so many data points that I hope there's no outliers. I hope there's not like one bad day you had going to kill your grades kind of stuff, right? Make sense? Right. So there are four handouts today, right? One, one from last, last, last lecture, one from today, and the homework assignment and the homework project, right? The homework project, you'll, you'll write a small program to, it'll, it'll parallelize a small program using threads. Um, and I encourage you to use pthreads, but if you want to use some other th threading library, let me know, right? Um, especially if you're using, trying to use Java or something. The idea here is to make sure that you can see the scalability. If you write a good code, and if it produces the right output, then you hope that as you increase the number of processors, as you increase the number of threads, you would see better performance, right? And unfortunately, or fortunately, the only four processor machine I know is the EXPSS SVR4. So if you want to program in Java, you have to figure out a Java which works on Linux and, and, and so on and so forth. So using pthreads <coughs> may be an easier option, um, but if there's other options, we can work with it, right? But you have to find a machine which has more processors because then otherwise you won't see the improvement in performance. If you had a two core machine, you only have two processors, so you expect your program to at best go from one times to twice as fast, but not three or four, what have you, right? So if you have any questions on the project, let me know after you get a chance to look at that. Make sense? So we, we can continue with where we left off with the, with the, with the scheduling, right? Um, and so the idea of scheduling, you know, we looked at some of the scheduling policies. I think we looked at first come first search, <coughs> shortest job first, priority, <coughs> round robin, what have you, right? And one of the key stuff I, I wanted to focus was there's not much magic in how you do it. You just want it to be fast. And you're trying to optimize on different parameters and some of the parameters may mean that you do one or the other, right? So you have to ask yourself, can you come up with another schedule, scheduling algorithm, which could be fast, but it may do something different. So for example, what happens if you do um, 
You saw shortest job first, did the longest job first. What do you think that will do, right? Is that preferable at all? Um, can, you, can you imagine a scenario where it's preferable, right? Because remember, you have multi-level queue. So if, even if it, meant, if it made sense for a few class of applications, you can have a separate scheduling class and put those applications there, right? And if you think about longest job first, it makes sense for some applications, not necessarily for everyone, right? Um, and similarly for, it's a first come, first serve, first come, last serve, right? Some of them may make no sense at all for anything. Some of them may make, make, make sense. The other policy is, what about random, right? You have a bunch of, bunch, of bunch of processes which need to run. What would a random policy do, right? So do you want to imagine what a random policy would do? You're just picking randomly from the, the, the queue, right? You're not doing any, let's say no priority or what have you, just do a random pick. What do you expect that would to do? Assuming the random function is very uh, cheap and fast to compute. Would that be a bad policy? I remember the answer is depends, so that doesn't count, but... Um, what do you expect a random policy to do? Yes? I expect the programs to get uh, somewhat equal time. Mm -hmm. Would that be any different than round robin? Round robin does the same thing, right? It's kind of does a predictably, you know, if you have like three, it, it goes one to three, one to three, one to three, and so on, right? Random in the long term, you expect it to be like round robin, right? If you if you look at the random numbers over a long time, you expect to pick one and two and three with equal probability. So even though it may go one one two, one, one, three, or whatever, in the long term, you expect them to be like a round robin in terms of equally uh, giving the numbers, right? Um, have, you, have, you, have, you, have you looked at how to generate random numbers in computers, like pseudo random numbers and stuff like that yet? If you haven't, you probably go through that in uh, algorithm class, right? So the challenge here is you have to find a real random number generator. And since computers are, are mostly predictable, you have to do a predictably random number, right? Ignoring those, in the long term, you expect them to be, to be the same as round robin. In the short term, it may not be the same, right? Like in the short term, it's perfectly statistically possible to have one, 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 and still be fair in the long run, right? So it'll be interesting to see what it does. It, it might turn out to be a good thing, or it might turn out to be a bad thing, right? Um, and if you are adventurous, you can always try it on one of those those machines, right? The, the if you look at the the uh, like a kernel like Linux, it should be easy for you to figure out where this decision is being done and replace a few lines of code with uh, with something to make it random, right? You expect it to be easy. It may or may not be easy because operating systems are, are a complex piece of code, right? But the assumption is you ought to be able to do it. So if you, and if you want to try it, um, that's a good thing. And if you want to propose that as an alternative to any project, um, I'm fine with that too. Okay? Toward the class, if you say, I don't want to do the project <coughs> that you're proposing, but I want to try something else, discuss that with me and we'll see how, uh, how complex it is, right? I don't want it to be so complex that it ends, ends up to be a thesis kind of work, but I don't want it to be too simple either, right? So anyway, so you can think of all these algorithms, and it, some of them may work and some of them may not work, and um, you cannot really tell whether one is bad or, or poor, um, and I think the key here is you want to make sure that the computations are simple. If random took two milliseconds to compute the random function, then I think clearly that would be a bad idea, right? You should, if you're, doing context switch every 10 millisecond, and you have to make a decision, the decision process takes like two or three millisecond, then the overhead is so high, you probably don't want that, right? But otherwise, some of these policies may make sense in some, some particular class, right? And, and so, to, to give a sense of how operating system deal with that, like Windows XP, uh, we'll, we'll look at Windows XP and, and Linux scheduling. Windows XP deals with lots of different priorities. So it has different pro process classes, and each process class has a uh, notion of a um, priority. And it uses the priority to give you the sh appropriate schedule, right? 
and it ages those uh, those priorities. So you, if you give a pro process a priority, it'll age. If you, if you keep use, if you're a high priority process and you get lots of CPU, then your your real priority ages with the stuff. There's a bunch of numbers. You don't have to remember what the numbers are, but essentially, they they try to give different process classes different priorities, and depending on what your real priority is, you get to run faster or or, or, or slower, right? So if you're a high priority task, then you get more CPU, so, so you may finish quicker or, or so, right? Linux some, does something which is, which is uh, uh, the, at least modern Linux does something which is considered um, interesting. It's an O of one scheduler, um, which if you haven't taken an algorithm class, you may not know what uh, big O notation is. But essentially that means that the, the complexity to do scheduling does not depend on the number of processes on the, on the queue. It depends on a constant, right? To, to schedule one process, it takes the same amount of time as scheduling thousand processes, right? So the way Linux schedules a process, which may help answer what you observed in the homework project one, is each of the processes, it gives you a bunch of tokens, a bunch of uh, something, a time slice, right? So think of that as a currency, right? So at the beginning of the scheduling process, right, at the beginning of some, some time, you distribute this, these cookies or these, these uh, time slices to different processes based on priority or what have you, right? So there are three processes. You may decide to give 50% to one, 25% to other, 25% to other, right? So you give them sort of this, these, these time slices, and then you, you schedule them based on how much they have, right? And every time they use a CPU, they use up the, those credits, credits, right? So if you have a process which has 50, which was allocated 50, and it was the only one which is running, it used up all its 50, right? Then you, after that, you have to wait for the other two processes to run and use up their slots before you give uh, anything back to this process, right? So the idea of giving this different proportion is to say how, how much you want to give to the higher priority task compared to the lower priority task. The way you make them all fair is to say that if the, if the one which had the most, most cookies, if it finished sooner, it has to wait for all the other ones, right? So even though the allocation was more, it can't completely hog up the system. So they use that to give fairness, ease, ease of computation. But, but essentially, it has two lists, and when, when your slice expires, you are put in the expired list. And when everybody's slices expire, you re re reallocate these, these tokens, right? So that's one way for them to make the, the, the algorithm simple. And, um, and fair, right? And they have, an, they have two classes, one is real-time, one is the normal processes. Real-time does first come, first, uh, first serve, um, and, 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 and round robin. So, th so they have different classes, but within the normal processes, they do this, this, these cookie notions, right? And so they also have different time quanta for different tasks, and most of your projects you are probably running it as a normal process, so you, you probably got 10 millisecond if you had compiled the kernel with 10 millisecond as the clock. You, you, you change this number, right? You change the hertz from 10 to uh, 1 millisecond, right? 1,000 hertz is 1 millisecond, 100 hertz is 10 millisecond. So you change how much time the decisions were changed, right? So that that may explain why why your system showed or didn't show the, the kind of uh, difference you expected. Um, so you can play tweak these parameters to get the right stuff that you wanted, right? Make sense? So that's that's sort of at the end of the the first module. So we're looking at mostly on the notion of processes and threads and how they are allocated and, and stuff like that, right? So the, the next module continues with, with the prior module and introduces a notion which we didn't really address on the first module, which is the notion of synchronization, right? In the first module we talked about threads. We have talked about threads which are on the same uh, address space. And we said they, 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 each thread has access to all the data in the system, right? And I kind of mentioned that that's, that makes the programming tricky. And we'll see why it makes it tricky and, and how you pre prevent that, right? And that's the notion of a synchronization, right? Synchronization is a way for you to get predictable results 
right? The predictable results may not be as predictable as you would like, right? The, the goal here is if it is completely predictable, then the performance gain you get is not that good. So you, your, your goal here is to make sure that they are sort of unpredictable, but you cannot be able to predict, right? And we'll see what the notion of serializability and all those things, right? The idea here is if you have two threads, and if both the threads are in lockstep, meaning if there's one instruction on the one thread, the other thread also operates on one thread, if you do that, then the system will be completely predictable. Every time you run the program, you always get the same results, which also means that if one thread wants to go fast, it can't because it has to go lockstep, right? So you want the threads to go at whatever speed they want, but have some set of uh, barriers to say that at this point, I would get some predictable results. It'll, it'll, it'll become clear as we move, move, move on, right? And as you will see, the programming with threads is a lot more tricky than you would realize, and hopefully you'll see that for the homework project too. Um, and, but, the, but the problem is you, you, do, you really don't have a choice if you want to get the most performance out of a system, right? The future is towards multi-core, multi-processes, multi and, and so on and so forth. So if you have more processes, and if you want to get both the performance out of the system, you have to deal with threads. You have to deal with all this in, uh, the um, unpredictability, right? So, so this, this model is more important as we, as we move forward, right? So first, before, before we, we start anything, I'll, I'll give you a sense of what the problem is, right? So we'll go back to the producer-consumer problem we looked at before. And let's assume that there's a shared variable called counter. And the producer uses the counter. So whenever it produces something, it increments the counter. And the, and the consumer will, whenever it consumes something, it'll decrement the counter, right? And that's a good way to uh, implement these kind of systems. And So here's the here's a little code segment of how you might implement this. At the top is the producer, at the bottom is the consumer, right? So they all go in an infinite loop. So the producer keeps con producing. So when the um, if the count goes to buffer size, that means the, the buffer is too full, then you stop. But otherwise, you produce an item, put that in the buffer, and then you increment the uh, the count, right? And it's a circular circular queue within an array. So you, you increase, increase the count there. And on the, on the consumer side, if there's nothing, wait, right? You, you go in this while loop, you keep uh, going. And once there is something, right, which will be set by the other, other, other producer, right? So to begin with, when there's no items, the consumer will be waiting here. The producer comes along, count is still zero, and count is not buffer size, so the first while loop goes through. And then the producer puts next produce into the buffer, right? And makes the count to be one. The moment that the producer makes the count to be one, the, the consumer thread will fall out of this loop, it'll consume the contents, and it'll decrement the count, right? Does that make sense? So you have two threads which are simultaneously running, and they're both going in sort of, after, as soon as the producer finishes, then the consumer can go, go do something. And the buffer is there so that the producer can be ahead of the uh, consumer, right? The producer produces lots of items. It can keep producing more items. And the consumer can come in and take it at, at some, some interval, right? So they're coordinating their, their actions through this count variable, right? So as soon as the count becomes incremented there, uh, this count decremented here, they, 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 they control how far they can go, right? If the count is not decremented, Eventually, the producer will stop because the buffer size will get filled up, and if, the, if there's nothing produced, the count cannot proceed, right? Make sense, right? So it seems like a simple, simple enough program, right? And this is perfectly possible with the threads because threads, by default, the count variable is shared, so you have the, the, uh, the behavior that you wanted. The problem com comes when you try to implement this on a real system, right? We try to implement this on a real system, if you, th if you take architecture course, your C program, or, or compiler course, your C program will have to be translated to something that the machine can operate on, right? So most of the machines, you cannot operate on a direct memory variable. You'll have to load it into a register and then modify it, right? So in that sense, your count plus plus may be implemented as 
you load the variable count into register, register one, and you increment the register, and then you write it back, right? And on the same same count, the count minus minus may be implemented this way, right? You load the variable of count into register, you decrement it and write it back, right? This is a simple example. In real systems, if, you, if you're doing compilers, you want to keep it in memory as far as possible. So you don't write it back all the time. So in the example I, I, I give, the register two is written back to the count immediately. But real compilers would, would keep it in register for a while because the registers are much faster to operate. Remember in the memory hierarchy, registers are much faster than memory. So if you want any kind of performance, you want to keep them in registers as much as possible. So you may not write it back into the count for a, for a while, right? But even if you assume that they are written back immediately, so your, your count plus plus and count minus minus becomes three different instructions, right? The problem comes when, the, when you don't know how exactly they're interleaved, right? So, here is one particular way of how, how these things may happen. So if you, if you have the, the first thread, so depending on the different ways of this happening, right? So the, you may have thread one load the contents into register one, right? But before you can write it back, right? The second thread may also read the contents, right? So if they both happen at the same exact time, the value of count is loaded by both the threads into their registers, right? Both of them increment it, and both of them write it back, right? The order in which you'll see, so the output after this code segment depends on who won, right? So if the first thread, if both of them loaded them into register one and register two, right? And both of them added, and then they decide to write it back, right? So whichever, whichever was the last one, will get right to its values before the other, right? So if the first, it, it's both of them loaded, and then the first one went ahead, so it'll go ahead and it'll increment the value, but the second thread will come around and decrement the count, right? Which means that the output can be four or five or six, right? Depending on the order that you, that you um, ended up doing, because the initial value was five, right? You expect that if both of them went through if you take a value of five, after you run both of those, the count should be five. But depending on the order, it could be four or six. Is it clear why you would get six? Six would be, let's assume that both of them loaded the value, right? So thread one has register one equals five. Thread two has register value of five, right? And then thread one does register plus, so register one will become six, and thread two register one will become four, <coughs> right? And then let's say thread two finishes, so it, it writes four into count, and then thread one finishes, so it writes six into count, right? Does that make sense? Yes. It's really important that you understand this because this is, the whole section depends on this notion, right? So you have, one, register two, right? Two register values. And the first instruction you do is, you say, reg one equals count and So you have two independent threads, so they can both be going, they are both going in parallel, which means that register one would be five, right? And register uh, two would be five, right? You see the back, right? So you say both to be five, right? Let's assume then the, the next instruction gets run um, parallelly, which means that this will become six and this will become four, right? This is decrementing the value. This is decrementing the value. At this time, count still continues to be five, right? It continues to be five at this time, right? So 
If at this time this goes first, so count will become 4. And if this goes next, then count will become 6. Right? If on the other hand, this one went first, then count would be 6. And then this will go, the count will be 4. Right? How can you still get 5 with this scenario? If you, with that code, you expected, I mean, if, if, if you started with the value of 5, you expected the value to be 5 after this, right? One is trying to increment, one is trying to decrement. So you expect them to be 5, right? How do you get it to be 5? What has to happen for them to become 5? Yeah? They execute sequentially. Yeah, they execute sequentially, right? Or they, they execute such that only one of them will go through. It doesn't matter which one, right? You, you, the first one can go through, or second one go through. So if you do execute them sequentially, that means you expect the first one, let's say the first one goes through, right? At the end, count will go to six, and then the next one will read that six from the register to register two, and then it'll decrement it, right? So it'll, do the, it'll be the same either way. So if you go, let thread one go first, or thread two go first, but if you expect only one of them to go through, then you get, a more predictable answer, right? The, the halfway through it may be different, right? So if, if one of them goes, so, so it, it may be possible to go from five to four and then to six or what have you, but you get a predictable answer, right? So that's the problem that we are trying to solve, right? How do you make sure that how do you deal with this or, or like what's the problem, right? And this is a problem because you, you want these things to go in parallel. You don't want them to go in sequential all the time, right? Suppose they were not operating on the same variable, right? It doesn't matter. You, you, you can let them go because you then that's how you get the performance, right? So you need a mechanism to say, you need a notion to say there are some code which depends on other stuff. So those I need to have so to define some way such that two of them cannot operate on the same time, and let's call them critical sections, right? These critical sections are different. There are critical sections and there are non-critical sections. Non-critical sections, you can do whatever you want, and the output may not matter. If, if these, this one happens to be count one for thread two, count two for, uh, so count one for thread one, and count two for thread two, this piece of code does not matter. They're operating on different variables, right? If they're operating on a shared variable, then you define them to be a critical section. And you have to have a way of making sure that only one thread can be inside at any one time. Unless you do that, your, your system will give you unpredictable results, right? Four or six maybe, so, so, so you know, if both of the threads finished and then you still end up with the value of four, that means one item is gone, right? One count was kind of lost, and you don't want that. So if you do that, then your program will give you errors that is very hard to un uh, debug and stuff, right? They all, because they all depend on the timing. So for, for this system to work, if you write this program, and if you keep running this over and over again, right? So sometimes you'll get four, sometimes you get a five, sometimes you get a six. To debug this program would mean that, depending on the particular scenario, you may get different results, and one of the results may actually cause you to segmentation fall, other one may not, right? So you keep worrying about the stuff, right? So the, the order depends on a whole bunch of stuff. It depends on how fast your system is, it depends on what other things are running, right? So debugging these things are not trivial at all, right? Especially if you use a debugger. In a debugger, you stop your program. I think I mentioned in the last uh, one of the lectures. You stop the program and, and you single step through, right? And if you single step through, you may luck out and go through one particular sequence, but it's not as unpredictable as a real system. Real systems, all, the, all these things go in parallel. So if you single step through the stuff, your program may work, but when you let it run, it will give you bad results, right? So try this on any, any of the, of the, any of the action machines, because the, all the machines are dual core. And this is the challenge. Unless you solve this issue, your program will not work, right? So can you solve this pro pro problem by making a whole program into a critical section, somehow defining the whole program to be a critical section, such that 
you will not run into this problem, right? Would that be a good solution? So you wrote a multi-threaded program for the say homework project too, and it's doing something that you didn't know what it's supposed to do. I mean, you're getting results which are not what you expected, right? I maintain that one way to solve that is to define a whole program to be critical section, right? Would that be a good solution? Would that solve your problem? Will that solve this uh, this kind of a problem? Somebody wants to take a guess? Yes? You would solve that particular problem, but you'd be defeating the purpose of doing it in parts. Yes. So, it'll, yeah, it will solve the problem, but it will defeat the whole purpose of you having multiple threads anyway, right? You have multiple threads. If you put the whole thing into one, one uh, critical section, that means only one thread can go. So, essentially, you're making the program sequential, right? So, you don't get the benefit. So, why bother to have a multi-threaded program when all you're doing is having a single thread, right? It sounds like a dumb idea, but sometimes it's not so dumb, right? Like, so, some of the, like, the... It, the, the programs are a lot more multi-threaded now than they were a few years back, but this is exactly what was happening within operating systems, right? For a, for a while, operating systems supported threads, but not within the kernel itself, because they had these issues, some, some bugs somewhere into, inside the operating system, and these things are extremely difficult to debug, right? So since they couldn't debug, and let's say you have the shipping date is tomorrow, the best thing is to say, okay, it's a multi-threaded program, put the whole thing into a critical section, ship it out, right? You'll be surprised how many, how many software vendors actually do that because it's just very hard to debug these things, right? Because you have these, all these things running. And, and the, to debug these things, imagine this, you have to think, you, you know, if you want to do it, visualize this in your, in, in your brain, right? You have to think of multiple things happening at the same time. So it's, it's harder and harder while you add more threads. So I think, I think if you look at PowerPoint, I think it uses like 57 threads, right? So imagine 57 threads running, and they're all operating on the same data, right? You have to have understanding of all these 57, what they're doing, where they're at, at any one point. You want them to be doing independent stuff, but when they do a critical section, when they go into this, this shared stuff, you have to do something, right? How do you know whether some variable is shared? Is, is that up to the programmer? Is that up to the operating system? Is that up to the compiler? Who's supposed to define these critical sections? Do you think? This, this is an important concept you need to understand before we can go into the module because the whole thing of trying to solve this depends on you understanding what the problem is and, and who would solve it, right? So in this case, in the example I, I gave you, right? Let's go back to the previous slide, right? After I explain this to you, it sounds like count is the variable that needs to be protected, right? And so if you, if you have a notion of a critical section, you'll somehow put the critical section around the count. So whenever the count is modified, you want them to be protected, right? And you want the other stuff, the operating on the buffer and stuff, to sort of go in parallel, right? Right? But, but you're also sharing the buffer here, right? The buffer here and in and out are also being shared, right? So how do you know which is a critical section, which is not a critical section, right? Why, why didn't I put this in around, if I wanted to put a critical section around count, why wouldn't I also do that around buffer? Because buffer is also being shared, right? Or should I put a critical section around the whole code? Does that make sense? There are two shared variables here, count and buffer, right? I'm only talking about count, I'm not talking about buffer at all. Am I missing something? So the, the, the answer is, 
The critical section notion is entirely up to the programmer, right? The operating system cannot tell you what it is. It's entirely up to the programmer on, on defining what a critical section is, right? And that's important to know because when we talk about critical section solution and stuff, those are entirely up to the programmer, right? From an operating system perspective, I don't care how you program, what it does. Operating system will give you primitives which can help you write a good program, but it will not solve the problem, right? So that's important to understand. This whole module is about how programmers should write their code and what primitives that OS can give you to help you solve the problem. It's not the job of operating system to solve the problem, right? That, that's one of the philosophical differences here which you may bump into, right? There's, there's no one else defines what a critical section is, right? In this particular code, the buffer would not be a problem because of the way we wrote the code, right? We are writing the code such that once the, the producer writes into some buffer variable, the, the consumer can only take it after the count was incremented, right? So they never simultaneously write into the same array index, right? In and out will never be the same exact stuff, right? So the, the, this code cannot store buffer size values. It can only store buffer size minus one because you, you have one item which is not being shared, right? So even though they're operating on the same shared variable called buffer, the, the code will never write into the same exact array index because of the way the code is written, right? So you need to understand what the code does to say, According to my logic, there is no possible case where in uh, the buffer in and out are operating on the same exact values, right? And that, that is important, right? So if you realize that, then you would only put a critical section around this because you know that this two will be operated on the same time. The buffer, they, you know, they look like they're being operated on the same time. They're not operating on the exact same values, right? <coughs> So if you as a programmer realize that, then you can put the uh, whatever primitives on a more fine grain, right? Because you as a programmer, your goal has to be you lock, you, you protect the least amount of data, right? Like you said, if you just protect the whole thing, then your code will have no problem with the, with the synchronization. But it will run only one time as fast as um, one, one processor, right? You cannot use the whole thing, right? So that's a challenge that you as a programmer have to go through, right? If you're kind of lazy, you can say, just, just put a, protect the whole thing, <coughs> be done with it. But a real programmer would want to kind of do the stuff so that they lock the least amount of data, but the whole, the whole thing is up, entirely up to the programmer, right? And which may, over the years I've seen that, you know, it comes as a surprise to a lot of, lot of students because they don't like to worry about all the stuff, but, whether you like it or not, that's the reality of how these things work. So if you have multiple uh, processors, you have to code these things. And if you are not careful, if they share the same variable, then you will run into a problem like this, right? The way to solve them is to make the run programs run slower in lockstep, which is not a solution. The way to solve this problem is to run with using only one processor, which is not a solution either. The way to solve them is to use the threads and use them wisely. Uh, but when you run into problems, threads with, with uh, problems with threads, they're very hard to debug because you have to have a clean understanding of what what is happening and uh, why these are going. Right. The reason I'm, I'm stressing this is when you when you so I was talking to one of the one of my friends who's at Apple right now, and, and I don't know how many of you know about a operating system called B. Right. There's a operating system called B, which which went out of business a little bit back, and then. One of the developers who had developed a file system on that one moved into Apple. So he, he was one of the leads on the, um, the Apple Spotlight and stuff, right? So if you, if you use a Mac, it lets you search the contents and stuff like that. So he's, he's very involved with the file system, right? So within the, uh, within the Apple, Apple computer. So he said one of the things that he does when he interviews people is give them a little synchronization problem, right? Little, little, give a little thread and to ask them to find uh, problems with it, right? Because his point is, they're not going back to a single processor case. I mean, Apple does not make single processor anymore, right? So there's no point in going to a single processor. You may or may not ever end up writing code. You may become a manager and never write code or something, right? But if you don't understand what are the issues with multi-threads, then you don't understand the, the problems with modern coding, both as a manager to manage people who are coding or, or what have you, right? He's like, I can, I can separate out the, 
the two class of people by just showing them the code. You know, they can say I took a, all the courses, but once you see the code on what happens, right, you have to understand the logic to know this set of sharing is okay, this set of sharing is not okay. You have to know which one to be protected, which one not to be protected. And if you didn't protect it, you have to understand where these things fail, right? And I understand that we cannot you know, learn all that stuff from one little course, especially one module, right? Hopefully the project two will, will really help you because you, know, you, can, you can see how you write this program and stuff. But, you know, it, it may be, it may be, it may sound tricky, but bear with me because it's very important, right? Oh, sorry, thanks. So that's the notion of a critical section, right? So you, so you, you kind of define some piece of code that to be a critical section. Again, the, the def definition is done by the programmer, right? Operating system does not know what is a critical section, what is not a critical section. You as a programmer define something as a critical section, and you as a programmer will, will tell you what primitives that you can do that are assisted by the operating system, which will say that this is a critical section, right? And we'll define a notion of remainder section, and we'll, we'll define what, what how these things will work and so on and so forth, right? But remember that critical section is not defined by anybody else by the pro but by the programmer. But for our case, we'll say this is a critical section, it's not a critical section. But that differentiation is entirely up to the programmer. If you look at a Linux kernel, you won't see anything which says that, you know, this is a critical section, this is not a critical section. You have to go through the stuff, right? Especially when you go to the, the kernel, Linux kernel, you will see that things become a lot more complex than you, you, would, you would like, right? For example, one way to do that is to, let's say, start a critical section, end a critical section in, in a single piece of code, right? But frequently what will happen is you'll start the critical section here, and then from there you go to another function, another thread, and so on and so forth, and you'll end the critical section in some other spot, which is how the kernels will be written, or your program will be written, right? Because you as a programmer know that I need to, I need to define something here, and you have to follow along the, the execution, which may jump around to different functions, and you may unlock at a different location, right? So it's not always as clear as what I show in the illustration, where I say, start a critical section, end a critical section, right? The end of critical section is where the code goes, not where, where it's easy for you to see, right? So you need to understand, follow this logic, right? So if you look at a device driver, the locking may be done at the start of the device driver, it may be unlocked somewhere way down into the kernel, um, but you need to understand how these things will work by looking at the code, not the operating system, right? So we'll, we'll get back to this on the next lecture because this is a very, very, uh, very important. But I'll, I'll, I'll start with the definition here. So the idea here is once you, have, once you define this notion of a critical section, there are some conditions that need to be met by whatever primitives that the operating system gives you, right? And these are done so that you can have some sort of a predictable performance, right? The one thing you need to understand with the threads is you never get predictable performance. It's completely okay to, for you to get different, uh, different outcomes, right? But these are there to give you some sort of a, uh, understanding of how these things are supposed to work, right? So the, the, the three conditions are, um, Whatever mechanisms we'll define for defining critical section, right, you will, you will be guaranteed mutual exclusion, right? Which means that only one thread can be inside that particular piece of code at any one time, uh, or none at all, right? So if you use the primitives that the operating system will provide you, and you define something as a critical section begin and end, that means you're guaranteed that no two processes can be inside that, that section, at, no, no two threads can be inside that section at the, at the same time, right? The, the others, others, other notion is, is uh, notion of progress, right? You are guaranteed that if, if you, um, if, if there are no threads inside the critical section and there are threads which are trying to enter the critical section, right? So the decision on who will enter the crit uh, critical section is distributed and it's, being, it's done by threads which are in the reminder section, right? 
So if there are no threads inside the critical section, then somebody will get to go, right? But the ones who decide who will decide that somebody else should go would be the one in the reminder section, right? Which is the one which just finished the critical section. So you have critical section, you have the beginning of critical section, you have the end of critical section. So at the end, you somehow decide somebody else will go through, right? And this distribution is, is um, this, this decision cannot be sent off forever, right? Which means that when there are multiple threads which need to get in, they will eventually get in, right? Which is a simple way of saying it. But essentially, you're not guaranteed which one is gonna go, but you're guaranteed that somebody's gonna make a decision and that one is not the ones who are waiting for the threads, but the ones that are just finished the threads. So the ones that just finished out of the critical section would decide that somebody else will run, right? So it's also fair because the people who want to go into the critical section are not the ones which are making decision. And the last case is it's a, it's a bounded wait time, right? Which means that I'm not guaranteeing, so if, if there are three threads which need to get into the critical section, two will say that when one of them goes to the critical section and finishes, it can give up the threat, it can say somebody else can go, right? But that may mean that one thread may never get to run, right? And so the third condition says that though I don't guarantee any particular order in which these threads will go, so there are, one, there are three waiting, right? They may go, they may get to go in any order, right? So if there are three and they came in the order one, two, three, right? The, the order in which they go to the critical section may be three, two, one, or three, 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 three two, one, right? But it's never the case that one thread never gets to go through the system, right? So you'll, you'll always, though I'm not saying this in any particular time sense, right? That does not mean that you'll go in any particular order. You will eventually go into the system, right? So these, so we, we'll, we'll say this again in the, um, in the, in the next lecture. But, but the, the key to understanding here is, I want a mechanism which is fast enough so I get, get good raw performance, but also gives me some of the guarantees that I want, right? The first guarantee is what I really want, that only one thread can get to go, go into the system, right? But I, I want to make sure that I'm not tied to say the threads have to go in certain order, right? So any thread can go depending on how this, the thing turns out, right? But you are guaranteed that eventually things will, will go through. So if you have four threads waiting, I cannot guarantee that they're gonna go in a first come first serve basis or whatever, what, what have you. They'll go in some order, but eventually all of them will go through, right? And, and this will become important when you have multiple uh, processors because each processor, there's a, there's a scheduler running which is deciding what to do. If I force the system to say it has to be in a certain order, that means they have to coordinate with each other, right? And in, in this model, you don't have to do that. You can, you can choose whatever you want. You, you just, you're just hoping that at the end, things will work out, right? I'll repeat this again in the next lecture because this is an important concept. And with, with this, with this, with this um, requirement, um, we, we, can, we can go to the whole module, right? I have the exams here. If you want to pick it up, you can pick it up here or come to my office.